Well, a couple months ago, I cleaned my garage. And I set into motion kind of the domino effect that brought me two weeks ago, prepping for this message and thinking about an expedition. Okay, so here's how it happened. I, I had listed a whole bunch of junk from, you know, you clean your garage, one man's junk is another man's treasure, and there's all this stuff. I probably should have just hauled it to Goodwill, but I thought, let me see if I can find some poor dumb sucker who will pay me five bucks for that and that and that. And guess what? They did, except for um, one item. I had even forgotten that it was on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, but I got a ping, that messenger thing, let me know that there was a message. Two weeks ago, somebody was saying, hey, that tabletop thing that you're looking to unload for five bucks, do you still have it, and could I get it? I called Donna, said, hey, would you set that out on the front porch? She did. I get home that night. The thing is gone, my junk. In place of it, there's $5 underneath the floor mat. How cool is that? So in the middle of this, I'm messaging back and forth with this person, and I find myself on Facebook Marketplace not as a seller, but rather just curious as a shopper. You ever scroll through there? (laughs) One man's junk is another man's treasure. You name it, it's probably there. For example, I couldn't believe this. This is so cool. I've got some pictures of this. I didn't want to put up the actual ad because the person's name in it, but this, this is the description of some of the stuff you're looking at here. Used on one Everest expedition. Mount Everest. Great suit. Will keep you warm. You can pay with PayPal. Venmo will ship in the U.S. I guess that's been on Everest. Who'd have thunk it? And for $550, you too could be the proud owner, of, which brings out all kinds of questions like, hey, if you do an Everest expedition, are you going to sell your stuff when you get back? Another question. It doesn't look very trail-worn to me, so I don't know what the story is behind that. And then it got me thinking, well, what else is he selling? So I went back to his page, and I looked all over. Not only is there that, but you could buy the boots that were bought some other pants, some Sherpa gear, climbing equipment. My goodness, stuff that was on an expedition to Mount Everest. How cool is that? And then I thought, I need that. (laughs) And then I thought, no, I don't need that. That's the last thing in the world I need. It's just going to end up in my garage, and then I'll be selling that junk later. Okay, the title of the message today is this word, provisions. Why? Well, because there's power in the meaning of a name. Let me tell you what I mean by that. My name My birth certificate says my name is Stanley. My uh, second grade teacher and my dad are probably the last folks to call me that. But that word literally means somewhere in middle school I became a Stan. But the word Stanley means from a stony field. There's not a lot of power in that name. My wife, Dawn, I don't need to tell you what Dawn means. That's actually not her first name, though. That's my wife's middle name. Her first name is Kayleen. It has a whole bunch of meanings, but I'm partial to this meaning of her name. It means beloved. I kind of love that. So beloved and from a stony field, when we discovered we were pregnant and expecting our first child, we kind of did the thing that expecting parents do. We looked through what, what, what is this name? What, what's a, meaning, a meaningful name that we could, we could choose for this child? We named him Micah, which asks the question in the original Hebrew, who is like God? In other words, nobody can measure up. But if you move one breathing mark just a little bit to the side, it actually uh, it says this. It says, one who resembles God. And as young expectant parents, we were hoping that he would live up to the meaning of that name. The season we're in right now, there's some meaning behind it. Christmas. Years ago, I was in the lobby of a different church having a conversation with somebody who was super frustrated. I don't know what she was mad about. The sermon went too long that day. Maybe the music was too loud. I don't know what it was. But she was frustrated. And it went from that thing into this whole diatribe about what's wrong with our culture today and and the music that they're playing and Christmas decorations are out before Halloween. or She was just on this like this rant. And she started talking about Xmas. They removed Christ from Christmas. I didn't have the heart to jump in. I just kind of let her rant a little bit. But actually, that points to the meaning of the name, right? 
it's actually kind of a, an abbreviated version of Christmas. For example, if I'm taking notes and I'm instead of writing out the word God, oftentimes I'll just write the Greek symbol. Uh, it's a theta, the first letter of the word theos in Greek, short for God. The key, the first word in Xmas, this is the first letter of the Greek word Christos, Christ, Mass. Oftentimes when I'm taking notes, I'll actually even misspell that. I'll put an extra, I did it when I was writing my notes for this, put an extra S on the end of that. X, Mass. Christ, Mass. Worship service for Christ. Because there's meaning to this. This whole thing is about Christmas. There's meaning in a name. We've been studying a passage the last several weeks. We're in it again today. This is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. There's meaning in a name. Four gifts we've been looking at that were realized, we looked at this last week in Galatians, in the fullness of time. This was prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus was born, but it had meaning that was poured on it when he was born, and it still has meaning that we're unpacking, that we're unwrapping today. For us, to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. The first week, we talked about how Jesus just like any good counselor, is present. That's the gift that we unwrapped. Last week, we talked about mighty God, that he's all-powerful. This week, we're looking at this idea of everlasting Father. Don't miss Christmas Eve services. We're going to unwrap, unpack this idea of Jesus being our Prince of Peace and lean into that in a great way at the end of this week. But today, we're talking about provisions, gearing up like any good father. Jesus, everlasting father. Our God, everlasting father. He provides for us provisions. Let's unwrap our present, shall we? I've been excited all week about this moment right here, unwrapping. Each week I've been stealing one of the nativity figurines out here. This week I grabbed one that represents the idea that we're talking about today, provisions. Father. It's Joseph. There's so much in this that I love, including his posture. Have you ever been around a brand new dad? Beaming with pride? It's interesting to me that in this nativity set, here's a dad down on one bended knee before his baby, who happens to be lying in a manger. Joseph, provisions, the strong, silent type. Again, two weeks ago, we we talked about all of these omni words, these theological words that we can see present in the nativity scene. That first week, we talked about wonderful counsel, the idea that God is present. We talked about omnipresence. All present. Not just all everywhere, that God is everywhere, but that God is here. He becomes Emmanuel. He's here with us today. Last week, we talked about the omnipotence of God, all powerfulness. Today, everlasting Father, he provides for us omniscient, all-knowing. He's got eyes in the back of his head. He sees the problem, and he's there with the solution even before we know about it. So today... I want to dive in on the idea of Jesus in a manger. Last week we talked about the tale of three kings. This week it's a tale of two dads. Jesus has two dads. I think about this every once in a while this time of year. I was a youth pastor for long enough, and I saw enough step families trying to navigate the craziness of the Christmas season and the Thanksgiving season. Who's going to have the child on this day? Who's going to have the person? Where the kid itself, you know, my, as a teenager, my goodness, do I go to this family? Do I go to this family? I've got stepbrothers and stepsisters, and I, I've seen that enough to recognize that that is not easy. Some of our families wrestle with the step nature of Christmas. Is it helpful for you to think about this truth? Jesus. Jesus can identify with you even in that space. Jesus had a stepdad that he was raised by. Joseph wasn't his real father. Put real in quotes there. We know that if we've studied that story before, but I want to look at Joseph, and I want to look at Jesus' other father, 
And let's grab, if we can, some life lessons from the life of Joseph. Let's grab some dadisms, if we can, some of these common phrases that dads are guilty of saying as we're seeking to unwrap gifts from the nativity story. Let's first look, if we can, at a temporary father, Joseph. Joseph, well, we don't know a lot about Joseph. He's not talked about a whole lot in our Bibles. He's the strong, silent type. But there are some life lessons that Joseph, I believe, imparts to Jesus that we see just kind of evidence to the character, of the nature of who he is, even in the verses that we do have that describe him. And let's talk about first kindness. This is a life lesson that we learn from the impending birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1. Joseph learns that Mary is with child. The problem, the problem is that he and Mary, his betrothed, are not yet married. He assumed that the child was from somebody else. Well, let's, let's read it together. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. He's going to marry her, but, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine being Joseph in that moment? Can you imagine Jesus' earthly father, just the crazy emotions that he must have been feeling? Well, let's, let's keep reading. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, some of you hear that and you, you have a reaction like, oh, what a jerk. But do you, do you see the language there? He's going to do this quietly. This was the right thing to do. He could have done it publicly, though. He could have made a big old laughing stock of her. He could have just kind of put her out in the public sphere and maybe saved himself some shame. But instead, he, he does it quietly. What is this? This is, this is a kindness. And then uh, something else changed his perspective entirely. Here's the second life lesson we grabbed from the nativity scene that I bet these were not uh, things that escaped Jesus' attention as he grew up. Second lesson is obedience. When we find, we ask the question, well, who is Jesus' father? We find ourselves thinking of his amazing qualities. Among them, of course, is obedience. And we see this amid Joseph's initial kindness toward Mary. He's considering divorce. Well, let's read the text, shall we? We're in Matthew 1, verse 20. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. This is God speaking through an angel to Joseph. Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you some truth, Joseph. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. There's some meaning in that name, Jesus. Did you catch that there? Salvation is going to come through this little baby, and Joseph, you get to be a part of it. So he listened to this advice, and then he went ahead and went and divorced her quietly, right? No. Now, he was, he was obedient to instruction. If you look down in verse 24, we see exactly what he did. He took Mary home to be his wife. Life lesson number two was obedience. Life lesson number three, check this out. He was a protector. We see this image of the strong, silent type here in Joseph, but strong. We'd looked at this story two weeks ago. The Magi come to visit, and they flee because Herod wants to kill all of the boys. And Joseph takes Mary, takes the child. They flee to Egypt, and he protects them there in that space. We see the end of the story in Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. Check this out. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. Go back home, Joseph of Nazareth. Go back home because I've got a plan to redeem the world through this child. Be obedient but be a protector. You've already done that. Thank you so much. For those who are trying to take the child's life, they're dead. So go back and let's launch this plan into place that I've got for the whole world. Joseph's repeated obedience and protective measures are a guide, I think, to all parents, myself included. Life lesson number four. 
I love this. We pull this from the text, but we also pull this, if we can, from the larger context surrounding it. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Here's a picture of Joseph, who he was, and maybe, maybe it gives us a glimpse into what Jesus did as an 8-year-old boy, a 10-year-old boy. Check this out. He's a provider. Joseph is a provider. Isn't this the carpenter asking of Jesus? Isn't this Mary's son? We assume by this point in time when Jesus is 30, we assume that um, Joseph is no longer living because he's not mentioned here in the text. Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? That looks like a bunch of apprentices to me. That looks like a bunch of sons who were trained in the trade of their father. Jesus is a carpenter. We assume then that Joseph also was a carpenter and providing. Now, that word carpenter is an interesting word. We, we read that and we tend to think, oh, this is uh, somebody who's good with a hammer and nails, good with wood, building things. The problem with that, in the region around the Galilee where Nazareth was, there wasn't a lot of wood construction going on. They built actually a lot of things with, with stone. But where? Where would they have been doing this? This probably uh, could mean stonemason. And you've got some boys helping dad out in the family trade. There wasn't a ton of building going on, a lot, not a lot of employment for uh, a carpenter, a stonemason in Nazareth. But guess where there was? 3.1 miles away. That's a 5K run. You could walk it in about an hour. An hour's commute away, how far is that? Well, like from here, this building right now, if you were to start walking toward Chipotle over on 146th Street, you'd walk just a little bit further than Chipotle. Do you know where Sephora is? I can't believe I know where that is. That's a makeup store. But I have a wife and a daughter. I know where that is. Oh, let me put it in this context. Dude, you're with me on this. It's right next to Five Guys. You know where Five Guys is? That's almost exactly 3.1 miles walk from this space. You could walk that in about an hour. That distance, there's a world-class city that distance from Nazareth. It is likely that Joseph had his boys walking with him from Nazareth, not to Sephora, but a city called Sephoris. Check this out. Let me show you some pictures, if I can, of Sephoris. This is uh, Joseph as provider. This is an aerial picture of Sephora, uh, Sephora's rather, just a few uh, uh, years ago. These are the ruins of the Roman city that would have been built up. There's an amphitheater. There's a colonnaded uh, portico. There's a, there's a walkway. There's all kinds of shops and there's all kinds of, of uh, buildings. Go ahead and hit the next slide. You can see some stones here that are laid in this Roman road and you see the remains of some of the buildings that were built up by a stonemason. It's entirely possible that Joseph, as provider, has his boys learning the family trade right there in that space. Let's look at the next picture. Here are some of the things that survive from that era, the Mona Lisa of the Galilee. Here's the synagogue in that city. Here's some intricate stonework. It's entirely possible that Jesus had a hand in the building even of that space. That blows my mind to think about that. Life lesson number four, Joseph was a provider but in our tale of two, get two dads. It's not just Joseph that invested the gift that we unwrap this Christmas time into the baby Jesus, but he's got a heavenly father as well, doesn't he? He has an eternal father. We looked at some life lessons. Dads are good at providing, also good at providing, uh, I'm going to call them dad-isms. Got a series of these I want to share with you. This is an example of a dad-ism. I'm one of three boys. I've also got a sister. I'm the oldest of four kids in my family of origin. And when I was younger, I don't do this as much now, but when my brothers were starting to feel their oats and I was a young, maybe 20-something, we'd do these family get-togethers in my dad's house, and invariably, a wrestling match would break out. One of my brothers would, you know, take me on, and we'd end up wrestling. And my dad, in the middle of that, would always yell out, Take it outside, boys. Take it outside. That became a dad-ism in our family. Would you believe just about a month ago, Thanksgiving, my boys are back. One of my younger brothers or one of my younger sons is feeling his oats and the older boys are back home. And before you know it, there's a wrestling match right there in the living room. They're pushing the furniture back. And I, I fought the urge. I didn't say it, but I felt it welling up in my throat. 
Take it outside, boys. I didn't say it, but I thought it. Here's a series of dad-isms that give us an idea of the picture that we unwrap here at Christmas time. Here's one. As we think about an eternal father, have you ever been guilty of saying this, don't get too big for your britches? Don't get too big for your britches. We actually looked at this just a minute ago during our communion time. Listen, God displayed humility in the Christmas narrative. It's all through there. We just sang that song that talked about the baby in a manger. Grows up to be the savior of the world on a cruel Roman cross. There is humility all through that story. You see it in the rest of Jesus' life as well. For example, when he's calling his disciples together, there's a passage here in John chapter 1, verse 46. You've got Nathaniel having a conversation with Philip. They're talking about this Jesus that they've just met, that they've just heard of. Where is he from? Nazareth. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Even the hometown that Jesus was raised in. He didn't grow up in Sephora. He grew up in Nazareth. Small town, small. Don't get too big for your britches. There's humility that's evident here in this story. Here's another. Dadism, if you will. How many of you say this? The sky is the limit. I've got young men now and young women in my family. My, my kids are starting to spread their rings and, wings and go out. The sky is the limit. Dream big. Let me say it this way. All things are possible with God. With God, actually, the sky is not the limit. Let's read. Back to the story. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin. A virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. You see how many times the text here is telling us what her station in life is at this point. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. It's been a long time since high school health class, but virgins don't have a baby. All things are possible with God. And Mary hears this life-changing news. What does she do with that? Well, she responds in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. I love this. I'm, your, I'm the Lord's servant. May your words to me be fulfilled. I'm willing to lean into this because the sky is not a limit. All things are possible with God. If you're saying that this is the way it's going to be, then this is the way it's going to be. I'm ready. Let's do this thing. How about this dadism? Sometimes I have said this, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Sometimes these words just fly out of our mouths, dads, right? Sometimes moms say these as well. We're not even, what do we really mean in this moment? But well, let me tell you what I mean by this. God often works in seemingly strange ways. And is it possible, is it possible even during the Christmas season that we could view that as a gift? Are you wrestling with something unconventional right now in your family? Is there something that you're dealing with right now and you're thinking, I don't know, God, how you're going to use this for good? Well, lean in. Let's look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Here's a gift. Don't put God in a box. His ways are not our ways. It's entirely possible that the life circumstances that you're feeling right now, God's going to use them in some way for his glory and to grow you up in faith. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. We just read it. The Lord appeared to, Moses, or to uh, Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what is conceived in her the Holy Spirit is a part of this. God works in mysterious ways. Lean in. How about this one? Your word is your bond. This is something that dads will often say, especially to our boys as we say, listen, you need to look them in the eyes and give them a firm handshake. Your word is your bond. Be honest. By the way, the Bible prophecies that God speaks, God always keeps his promises. We see this evident in the story of the nativity. Let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 76. Check this out. This is um, 
Well, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. This is God speaking to John the Baptist. He's going to go before Jesus. He's going to do this thing to prepare the way for God. But God has been doing this for centuries at this point. Remember, we said in the fullness of time, there's all of these prophecies that are saying the Messiah is coming. Get ready. And God keeps his promises. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, check this out. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive, we just read about that, and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And the footnote in my Bible says Emmanuel means God is with us. God promises. God delivers. What other, what other dadisms? Well, we could talk about kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. I hope you're not saying that to your son, stupid. But I hope you come back Christmas Eve service. We're going to talk about the simple story here and how God uses the simple opportunities to speak a profound message. He did it then, and in the fullness of time, he's still doing it now. Now, don't miss Christmas Eve as we talk about that. How about this one? We walked uphill both ways. This sounds like a grandpa more than a dad to me, to be perfectly honest. Tough situations build strong people. Maybe that's another way to say that. Here you go. God's plans don't always lead to easy journeys. That's easy for me to say. Maybe tell that to Mary, right? Here's the passage in Luke chapter 2, verse 6. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born in Bethlehem, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths. Moms don't want to do that with their newborn and place them in a manger. They really don't want to do that because there was no room available for them. We walked uphill both ways. When I think back to all the preparation and the anticipation of my first child's birth. The planning was laughable. It didn't go at all how we had planned. There was a bed rest season. There was early labor. There was a premature birth. But sometimes tough journeys yield the best stories and the best adventure. If you're walking through a difficult season right now, is it possible that the nativity story and the gifts that we unwrap are a reminder that walking uphill both ways Sometimes that builds character. Sometimes that builds faith. Sometimes that builds an opportunity to lean more into the good things of what God is doing in your heart right now. How about this one? Don't spend it all in one place. Dads love saying this after handing a kid a small amount of money, right? Like here's a quarter. Don't spend it all in one place. As if, as if you could do that. This kind of happens with the nativity scene. Christ's birth changes the world. This is not a story just for the one place of Bethlehem or just for the one place of the greater area around Jerusalem or Palestine or that part of the world. No, no, no. This is good news for all. Don't spend it all in one place. Spread this around. And as we lean in to this Christmas season, look at this passage, Luke chapter 2. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Not Bethlehem, not Jerusalem, not Palestine, but the whole earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Don't spend it all in one place. As As we unwrap this present, think bigger than just your small location. Think your neighborhood. Think your workplace. Think larger. How is God calling you to spread it around, not just one place, but this is good news for all? Okay, there's two sides of this gift. We've each week unwrapped the present. There's two sides to this gift. Let me show you the first side. God provides. Everlasting Father, God provides. This is his gift to us. And we're reminded of it in the Christmas season. Well, what, what does he provide? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's one thing he provides. God provides acceptance. He did then, in the fullness of time, and he still does that today. 
Check this out. I love this passage. This shows a picture of God's acceptance in a way that almost brings tears to my eyes when I read it. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he's no longer the baby in a manger. He's the man who's getting ready to go on mission to redeem the world. The God-man who's getting ready to just bring salvation to all of us through his actions. He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Check this out. A voice from heaven said, this is my son. I love him. I'm well pleased. What son doesn't want to hear that from their dad? The gift that we unwrap at Christmas. Through God, God provides for you whether you feel it right now or not. He provides acceptance. What else does he provide? He provides love. I love the way the gospel of John begins. Let's read this text together, shall we? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God from the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Gospel of John does not spend time telling the story of the nativity. But what he does is tell what the nativity accomplished. And if I could sum that up in one word, I would use the word love. That this is love on display. Actually, just a couple of chapters later, he continues in that theme. John chapter 3, verse 16, if you watch football, the touchdown verse, you know this well. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gives a good gift of love, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. What else does God provide? Well, check this out. He provides joy. God's presence fills those who seek him with joy. Joy to the world. We looked at this passage a couple of weeks ago. The Magi come from the east. We're in Matthew chapter 2. They come to Jerusalem and they ask, Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. Our hearts are motivated for this long journey. And then what do they do? Well, let's keep reading verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. God provides joy. And joy, you might notice, leads to worship. What else does it provide? Well, it provides hope. This is another thing that God provides. Acceptance, love, joy, and hope. There's two pictures of hope we see in this story here. Let's look in Luke chapter 2, verse 17. When they had seen him, they spread the word, these are the shepherds, concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary is filled with hope. The shepherds are filled with hope. Because God provides hope. What else does he provide? Well, he provides a whole bunch of stuff. Last for our list today, this is definitely not the last of what God provides, and it's definitely not the least. He provides salvation. Salvation. If we read the story of the manger scene, and we keep reading the story in the New Testament, the baby grows up to be the God-man who brings salvation to the entire world. This, this is what God provides through the manger scene. So, second side of the same gift, God provides some things. What's the other side of the gift? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're called to provide some of these same things. God provides, and then just like how God used his gifts to flow through Joseph to the boy Jesus, God provides us with gifts. We're supposed to re-gift them. You know what a re-gift is, right? You take that gift, you wrap it up, you give it to somebody else. God calls us to re-gift the gifts that he's given us to a world that desperately needs to see him through us. We provide some things as well. We re-gift some things. We provide, well, what do we provide? Acceptance. Acceptance. The question is, 
Are you? Are you re-gifting God's acceptance to the world around you? Remember I told the story just a bit ago about the lady who was grumpy. It's so easy to look at the world and say, oh, they're missing it. They've taken Christ out of Christmas. Well, do you accept them for where they're at and meet them where they're at? Maybe here's a dadism for this Christmas season, what's left of it. Mind your manners. Be careful because you represent Jesus. Does the world look at you and see somebody who, well, here's another thing that we provide, not just acceptance, but love. Do they really see love, God's love, flowing in you and through you when you look at them? Because we're called to provide love. Who needs your love right now? Who needs it? Who needs acceptance? And for you to actively love them, or God to love them, through you. Stop right now. Take a mental inventory. Which of your neighbors, which of your co-workers, which of your family members right now need you to actively lean in and love them? And then do it. Regift that good gift that he's given you. How about this one? We provide joy. Do we? Are we? Are you planning for joy? Have you planned for joy this Christmas season? Are you anticipating joy? By the way, happiness is temporary. Happiness will last, oh, maybe two hours after the presents are opened. Then they're old news. But joy is abiding. Seek joy in the deeper things in life. Parents, grandparents, could I challenge you to aim past happiness. Help your kids this Christmas season seek joy joy in their life. What else do we provide? We provide hope. We do. I don't know about you, but I've read the end of the book. I know how the story ends. And I know what God is calling me to do to be a part of bringing hope to a world that's, can we be honest? People are desperate for some hope right now. And if you've read the end of the book, do you feel that? Don't you want to re-gift that to pass that right along? Listen, if you can't lean into hope at Christmas time, I don't know when you can lean into hope. Which brings me to the last gift that he's called us to provide. To re-gift to the world we provide. This one takes a little bit to get there. We provide salvation. What? Well, remember, this is a re-gift. We don't provide it, but through us, how would God use us? How does he use you? How would he use me to bring salvation to somebody that's inside your sphere of influence? Might I suggest to you, we've been talking about this the last several months in the life of our church. We, rather than inward, we want to look outward focused. We talked about one life this past fall. You have one life to invest. Who's the one life that you're investing in? God wants to use you to re-gift salvation to somebody that you know. By the way, we put the call out for serving Christmas Eve because we said a couple weeks ago, listen, Christmas Eve, it's not for us. I mean, we're going to aim at us, but we also want it to be for them. So we want to be able to roll out the red carpet for your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors, for your one life that you're investing in, that you're inviting to come and be a part of what God is doing in your life. Thank you so much. So many of you say, yeah, I'll be willing to serve. I'm excited about Christmas Eve services. I'm excited about what God is going to do in this space. By the way, can I just have a little conversation with family? Can we have a family moment? Before we invite our guests in this next Friday and Saturday, can I just give you a sneak peek of a little bit of what we're going to be doing? We'll offer an invitation. That's definitely a part of the service. We want to roll out the red carpet. We want to have an experience that's fun and engaging and that people want to be at. Remember last week I said, think Christmas service meets a petting zoo. You want to invite somebody to come and be a part of this. It's going to be fun. It's going to be lighthearted. A simple gospel message. A moment to lean into the Prince of Peace and what he brings to us this Christmas season. And I'll offer an invitation. Can I encourage you, if you bring somebody with you and they happen to respond to that invitation, would you just walk up with them 
under the cross. Have a conversation. Be a part of that moment in their life. Also know that I'm going to give an invitation and I'm going to say something about, hey, some of us, we don't, that's not our next step, but for some of us, we've got all these questions about faith, all these questions about God, and we just want a safe space where we can ask those questions in an environment where we can ask our good questions, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to offer an invitation. Come and join me to be a part of a group like that. Maybe you want to nudge them. Maybe you want to encourage that person that I'm a trustworthy guy, that I'm a safe guy, that I could, they could enjoy hanging out with me and just nudge them toward that opportunity. Listen, if you have not yet taken that invitation that we gave you last week, we've got some more in the lobby. Please grab one of those. Find somebody inside of your sphere of influence and invite them to be a part of what God is doing in your life because God brings hope through you. He brings love through you. He brings acceptance through you. And he wants to bring salvation through you for you to re-gift this to a world that desperately needs to see him. Would you stand up with me? I want to pray for the busyness of this season. I want to pray for the week that each one of us is getting ready to step into. And I want to pray for Christmas Eve services. Would you join me in that prayer for what God will do in this space? Let me say this, if you're a guest with us today, please make it a point you heard us talk about starting points. Stop by there. We'd love to encourage you and tell you how much we love our church and give you a free gift. If you're here today and some of what I've just said kind of stirs up something inside you and you want to know more about this Jesus that we love, my friend Jake Harp will be hanging out under the cross and he would love to talk with you about that. Maybe pray with you and encourage you. Right now, would you bow your heads with me and let's go to our God in prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you for the truth of Christ Mass, that God comes near, and that just as a father provides well provisions for a journey, God, you're still in the business of providing for your people. You do it through Jesus with some skin on them, those people in our lives that are walking with you that influence us to think more about you, people like Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. And God, you continue to pour good gifts on your people. We say thank you. So this week, use us how you will as we lean in and worship you for who you are. And it's your name in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, Venture. Have a great week. We'll see you Friday night or Saturday night.